Stereotypes and cliches. Where opinion does not exist, the status quo becomes stereotyped and all originality is discouraged. Bertrand Russell. Stereotype and cliché serve a purpose as a form of shorthand. Our need for vast amounts of information in nanoseconds has made the stereotype vital to modern communication. Unfortunately, it often shuts down original thinking, giving those hungry for the truth a candy bar of misinformation instead of a balanced meal. The stereotype explains a situation with just enough truth to seem unquestionable. All the isms, racism, sexism, ageism, et al. are founded on and fueled by the stereotype and the cliché, which are lies of exaggeration, omission, and ignorance. They are always dangerous. They take a single tree and make it a landscape. They destroy curiosity. They close minds and separate people. The single mother on welfare is assumed to be cheating. Any black male could tell you how much of his identity is obliterated daily by stereotypes. Fat people, ugly people, beautiful people, old people, large-breasted women, short men, the mentally ill, and the homeless all could tell you how much more they are like us than we want to think. I once admitted to a group of people that I had a mouth like a truck driver. Much to my surprise, a man stood up and said, I'm a truck driver and I never cuss. Needless to say, I was humbled. Group think. Who was more foolish, the child afraid of the dark or the man afraid of the light, Maurice Freehill. Irving Janus and Victims of Groupthink defines a sort of lie as a psychological phenomenon within decision-making groups in which loyalty to the group has become more important than any other value, with the result that dissent and the appraisal of alternatives are suppressed. If you've ever worked on a committee or in a corporation, you've encountered group think. It requires a combination of other forms of lying, ignoring facts, selective memory, omission, and denial, to name a few. The textbook example of group think came on December 7th, 1941. From as early as the fall of 1941, the warnings came in, one after another, that Japan was preparing for a massive military operation. The Navy command in Hawaii assumed Pearl Harbor was invulnerable. The Japanese weren't stupid enough to attack the United States' most important base. On the other hand, racist stereotypes said the Japanese weren't smart enough to invent a torpedo effective in less than 60 feet of water. The fleet was docked in 30 feet. After all, U.S. technology hadn't been able to do it. On Friday, December 5th, normal weekend leave was granted to all the commanders at Pearl Harbor, even though the Japanese consulate in Hawaii was busy burning papers. Within the tight, good old boy cohesiveness of the U.S. command in Hawaii, the myth of invulnerability stayed well entrenched. No one in the group considered the alternatives. The rest is history. Out and out lies. The only form of lying that is beyond reproach is lying for its own sake. Oscar Wilde. <coughs> of all the ways to lie, I like this one the best. Probably because I get tired trying to figure out the real meanings behind things. At least I can trust the bald faced lie. I once asked my five year old nephew, Who broke the fence? I had seen him do it. He answered, the murderers. Who could argue? At least when this sort of lie is told, it can be easily confronted. As the person who has lied to, I know where they stand, where I stand. The bald-faced lie doesn't toy with my perceptions, it argues with them.
It doesn't try to refashion reality. It tries to refute it. Read my lips. No sleight of hand. No guessing. If this were the only form of lying, there would be no such things as floating anxiety or the adult children of alcoholics movement. Dismissal. Pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. I am the great Oz. The Wizard of Oz. Dismissal is perhaps the slipperiest of all lies. Dismissing feelings, perceptions, or even the raw facts of a situation ranks as a kind of lie that can do as much damage to a person as any other kind of lie. The roots of many mental disorders can be traced back to the dismissal of reality. Imagine that a person is told from the time she is a tot that her perceptions are inaccurate. Mommy, I'm scared. No, you're not, darling. I don't like that man next door. He makes me feel icky. Johnny, that's a terrible thing to say. Of course you like him. You go over there right now and be nice to him. I have often mused over the idea that madness is actually a sane reaction to an insane world. Psychologist R.D. Lang supports this hypothesis in sanity, madness, and the family. An account of his investigation into the families of schizophrenics. The common thread that ran through all of the families he studied was a deliberate, staunch dismissal of the patient's perceptions from a very early age. Each of the patients started out with an accurate grasp of reality, which, through meticulous and methodical dismissal, was demolished until the only reality, reality the patient could trust was catatonia. Dismissal runs the gamut. Mild dismissal can be quite handy for forgiving the foibles of others in our day-to-day -day lives. Toddlers who have just learned to manipulate their parents' attention sometimes are dismissed out of necessity. Absolute attention from the parents would require so much energy that no one would get to eat dinner. But we must be careful and attentive about how far we take our necessary dismissals. Dismissal is a dangerous tool because it's nothing less than a lie. Delusion. We lie loudest when we lie to ourselves, Eric Hoffer. I could write the book on this one. Delusion, a cousin of dismissal, is the tendency to see excuses as facts. It's a powerful lying tool because it filters out information that contradicts what we want to believe. Alcoholics who believe that the problems in their lives are legitimate reasons for drinking rather than results of the drinking offer the classic example of deluded thinking. Delusion uses the mind's ability to see things in myriad ways to support what it wants to be the truth. But delusion is also a survival mechanism we all use. If we were to fully contemplate the consequences of our stockpiles of nuclear weapons or global warming, we would hardly function on a day-to-day -day level. We don't want to incorporate that much reality into our lives because to do so would be paralyzing. Delusion acts as an adhesive to keep the status quo intact. It shamelessly employs dismissal, omission, and amnesia, among, among other sorts of lies. Its most cunning defense is that it cannot see itself. The liar's punishment is that he cannot believe anyone else. George Bernard Shaw these are only a few of the ways we lie or are lied to. As I said earlier, it's not easy to entirely eliminate lies from our lives. No matter how pious we may try to be, we will still embellish, hedge, and omit to lubricate the daily machinery of living. But there is a world of difference between telling functional lies and living 
a lie. Martin Buber once said, The lie is a spirit committing treason against itself. Our acceptance of lies becomes a cultural cancer that eventually shrouds and reorders reality until moral garbage becomes as invisible to us as water is to a fish. How much do we tolerate before we become sick and tired of being sick and tired? When will we stand up and declare our right to trust? When do we stop accepting that the real truth is in the fine print? Whose lips do we read this year when we vote for president? When will we stop being so reticent about making judgments? When do we stop turning over our personal power and responsibility to liars? Maybe, if I don't tell the bank the checks in the mail, I'll be less tolerant of the lies told me every day. A country song I once heard said it all for me. You've got to stand for something, or you'll fall for anything. <laughs>